Okay, the second application we'll be looking at is an application, one of the simpler applications is an application of parallel reduction. Uh, reduction is combining an array of elements to produce a single result. For example, uh, on the top level here, there's, a, there's an array of, uh, array of numbers. And reduction can make, take many forms, including we can add all the values in an array. That's a, that's a form of reduction. Finding the maximum value in an array, that would be another form of, uh, of reduction. We can, we can be calculating the average, the standard deviations, all that stuff, because we would be taking uh, the entirety of the array as an input and reducing a single resulting value from it. They're, they're all examples of a reduction operation. And if the operation, the reduction operation that we have to do is associative, meaning if the ordering has changed, if we don't have to do A plus B and then C, if we can, we can also do B plus C and then plus A, if the values are the same, if the operation is associative, then, uh, then the calculation can be done out of order in piecemeal so they can be parallelized. So it looks like a tree. We can do it, one way we could do it is do it in, like a tree in the shape of a tree like this. We can add these two numbers first, add, a, add these two numbers first, add these two numbers first, add these two numbers first, and then you know, do it in a parallel manner if we have more than one computation unit. So that's one interesting thing uh, that's that's the application we want to be look, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at today. And the immediate question that uh, we need to answer to get started on this is how, uh, to design the program that does this would be try to answer the question how best do we allocate work to individual threads? And if we think in a straightforward method, in a method that we're used to with um, a multi-threaded multi software implementation, the straightforward method would be uh, divide blocks of work. For example, if we have n uh, elements we want to reduce and we have k threads, we want to divide the blocks into n divided by k or such, and then uh, uh, give each thread a consecutive value of work, like the ones you see here. The red boxes would be consecutive values of work. And uh, each of these, uh, uh, blocks would be assigned to thread one, thread zero, thread one, so on and so on. Uh, the question would be, would this be an efficient way to allocate performance? For example, if we know that the uh, SIMD cores of uh, GPU, GPGPU accelerators work in units of something like warps, SIMD units with 32, but could change. And would this algorithm be a good fit for SIMD, maybe? Uh, would this uh, method be have good data access patterns? If you want to use shared memory, do you want to share, use shared memory, et cetera, et cetera? Would this give us uh, good data access patterns? And maybe you can try to reason about, I mean, right now you can try to reason about whether you think this is a good idea or not. And we'll come back to this uh, approach and evaluate if this is good or bad in a bit. But other questions uh, we need we want to answer before we decide on a on an algorithm include things like how many threads should be spawned, because the CUDA programming abstraction, for example, allows us to spawn many 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 more threads than there are available uh, as cores. But do we want how many threads do we want to spawn? We, do we want to spawn spawn only as many threads as cores? That would be too little threads because. Uh, if there's only the same number of threads as there are cores, as soon as one thread issues uh, off-chip global memory access, then there's no, uh, no threads to be swapped in to you know, try to hide the latency by, by doing some useful work uh, during while the first thread is waiting for main memory. So that would be two little threads. Main memory latency cannot be hidden. Maybe we want to spawn very, 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 very many threads. Is there a downside to this? That's an interesting question. If we have n threads, uh, if we have n values, we want, maybe we want to spawn n threads. Would there be a downside to this? Is there a lot of, uh, say, context switching overhead inside the GPU? Maybe. And all of these questions kind of complicate us trying to uh, design an efficient algorithm for doing even this simple, very simple application on a GPU. And we'll show uh, how, how all of these uh, uh, decisions affect the actual performance by how much. So the very first implementation that we can try to do to uh, get this to work 
method zero would be what we just talked about in the previous slide, have consecutive work blocks as assigned to each thread. So say we have, because uh, in CUDA computation is organized into blocks of threads, uh, if we have N blocks and M threads, uh, M threads each block, and we have N blocks, then we would have a total of N multiplied by M number of threads running. 10 blocks with 1,000 1, threads would result in 10,000 threads running in the GPU. And if we assign a chunk of work to each thread, after executing uh, the kernel, uh, each, uh, each kernel execution will reduce the data size from n, uh, well, from some number, it could be a very large number, to uh, the total number of threads in the kernel. If, the, if we spawn 10 blocks, each with 1,000 threads, after uh, running the kernel, we will have reduced the uh, n number of elements we want to reduce to uh, 10,000. So that's pretty good. But uh, we do need to uh, run it iteratively because we still do have 10,000 values we need to reduce. We can, if, if the number is small enough, maybe you can just do it in the CPU because the performance overhead of that would be negligible. But if there are many, 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 many threads, if we spawn millions and billions of threads, then we may need to run the, uh, to get the performance at the next iteration of the reduction operation. Maybe we need to run the kernel iteratively until everything is reduced down to one or either a small enough value so that the CPU can just do it. And the question here, again, it becomes how many threads do we spawn across how many blocks? Because again, if it's too small, not only will there be an issue of uh, uh, waiting for global memory accesses, but it might also in, uh, result in too many iterations. But because if we uh, have a billion threads spawned, then the res result of the reduction will still be a billion elements. And after that, we have to, again, run another kernel for to reduce a billion elements to, I don't know, a million elements. And then we run another kernel to reduce a million elements to a thousand elements. And this will result in many iterations. Is there a bad thing? Maybe. So for the purpose of the remainder of exploration, let's fix the threads per block to 1,024, which is the maximum number of threads for this architecture. And then just for the simplicity of uh, design space exploration, we're only going to change the block count. So the total number of threads will be increased or decreased, decreased in units of maximum blocks. So 1,024 threads, uh, unit of increase and decrease. So uh, without going into too much detail about the you know, scanning of the design space, when we were trying to implement this consecutive work block method, the peak performance of this algorithm was achieved when uh, we spawned enough threads so that each thread per kernel invocation reduced 64 elements or such, uh, 32, 128, and somewhere in that ballpark range. And discovery of this actually was, uh, required me to you know, change, continue changing the block uh, count uh, and then measuring the performance every time. And there was a wide range of things to look, be looking at. The, the, the performance was actually quite sensitive to this number, but the peak, so that's a bad thing because we don't know uh, if on a new architecture, on a new uh, whatever, new software, we have to at least do this uh, design space exploration once to actually come up with this number, which will give us you know, the best performance and having to do that is kind of annoying. But anyways, when we did reach peak performance, and, there, and I'm going to uh, emphasize here that depending on, the, on this parameter, how many elements per, per thread, there was orders of magnitude performance difference. So this is quite fickle. But anyways, it took 40 milliseconds, including the kernel invocation overhead everything. Uh, it took 40 milliseconds with the kernel that you see on the right here, uh, you can maybe take a deeper look at it when I upload the slides later today. Uh, to reduce, to add uh, two to the power of 30 elements. So two to the power of 30 elements would be approximately four gigabytes worth of integer values. And it took 40 milliseconds to add everything together. 
And as per usual, when we get a first performance number, the first question we have to ask is, is this good? 40 milliseconds, I mean, 40 milliseconds is a short enough time, but maybe it'll become, you know, if it's a piece of a, it's, if it's part of a performance sens sensitive uh, uh, subcomponent in a system, then maybe perform the uh, 40 milliseconds will be good or bad, we don't know. Uh, what we can know is, is this a number that is making efficient use of the GPU underlying GPU architecture, uh, underlying eGPU hardware? So 40 milliseconds. So let's do some back of the envelope calculation to see is this within the ballpark range of what we want. So reduction is an O of N complexity problem because ideally we would just scan over the entire array just once and you'll get the answer. Ideally reading each element exactly once. And there's not much computation per memory access. It's not like even, we're not even doing something like uh, 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 multiplication and then and and then addition or accumulation or anything like that we're basically just adding everything everything we read we just add it to the accumulator that we have so not much computation per memory so it's likely that this uh, application will be completely memory bound so the hardware that i was running on uh running these things on is a, a nvidia rtx 2080 ti it has a, G, a gddr6 memory which has a peak bandwidth of 616 gigabytes per second, according to the catalog. So you want to reach this utilization because if it's a completely memory, uh, memory uh, bound problem that we want to be using the peak memory bandwidth of the hardware. So two to the power of 30 elements, four gigabytes on a machine with 616 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, it will give us about six milliseconds of uh, no, we would be reading four gigabytes in approximately six milliseconds on a machine with 616 gigabytes per second. 616 gigabytes per second is a huge number for memory. Uh, it's, it would be kind of difficult to reach this kind of numbers on a regular old desktop. So in order to discover, uh, to you know, guide the way to discovering the best way to do this, uh, we're going to follow the guidelines from NVIDIA's uh, uh, document for optimizing parallel reduction in CUDA. This is a fairly old document. It was built back in 2007, so 14 years now already. So the numbers there were kind of old. It was running on an old, uh, older, one of the original uh, hardwares, GPU hardwares with CUDA support. So yesterday I went and actually uh, tried running everything on the, on the RTX 2080 Ti and gathered new numbers. So hopefully this will be more fitting to the modern age. So the first method, is using uh, the, I mean, it's called interleaved addressing. But how this one worked is that each block of each with 1,024 threads, because 1,024 threads is the maximum number of threads per block, which is supported by CUDA and for this architecture. And each block will reduce 1,024 elements to one. And it will use shared memory to, uh, you know, relieve the pressure from the global memory. And so every, for every invocation of the uh, kernel, the number of uh, resulting elements will be reduced by a factor of 1,024. So if we have a billion numbers, which we do because we're looking at two to the power of 30 elements, if you have a billion numbers, after a kernel invocation, it will be reduced to a million. After another third kernel invocation will be reduced to a thousand. After another kernel invocation will be reduced to one, which at which point we will have the answer. So we'll be invoking the kernel three times. And at each kernel invocation, uh, computation is reduction is done kind of like this. Let's say we have one thousand twenty four values in in which is assigned to a block, not a thread, a block. And each thread, depending by it can uh, know the work that it has to do depending on by looking at its own thread ID and you know the iteration of the computation. So this is in, within a single kernel invocation. There's a for loop that you can see here. Maybe after I upload it, you can, uh, if you're interested, you can take a little bit of more time looking at it. But depending on which thread I am, I can either uh, look at a value that is stride elements away, stride of one, stride of two, stride of four, stride of eight, 
to iteratively uh, reduce the values until if I am thread zero within the block uh, at the end of this for loop. So there will probably be 10 loops because we're reducing uh, 10,024 elements to one. At the end of the, all the loops, I will have iteratively reduced everything down to a single value. And at the end, if I am thread ID zero, I will write the value to the uh, output global memory so that this can be used as input to the next iteration of the kernel. So yes, it takes as input a global memory, uh, which is the input array, global memory, which is the output array, and how many elements there are that I need to reduce. At the very, very first kernel invocation, this is going to be 1 billion. After that, it's going to be 1 million, 1,000, and that'll be it. With this method, uh, performance is it's actually kind of worse than the one that we looked at before, just now, method zero. But bear in mind that method zero's performance was very sensitive to the number of blocks that uh, we, we had to spawn. But in methods one, we just spawn as many blocks as, uh, well, we pretty much spawn as many threads as we need, uh, as many threads as there are elements in the, in, in the array. So we, the performance of this method is not sensitive to the number of uh, elements is not sensitive to the number of blocks because the number of blocks that's going to be spawned is going to be deterministically calculated based on how many elements we want to reduce. And anyway, so performance uh, that we get from this approach is 47 milliseconds to reduce 1 billion elements, which is slightly slower than the, the best performance we could get from method zero. But it's, you know, the benefit of this is that it's reliable. It's not going to be sense performance isn't going to be sensitive to some parameter that you have to tune. But the bottom line is that uh, 47 milliseconds translates to 91 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth uh, on, the, on the GPU. And this is a far cry from 616 gigabytes per second that we're aiming for. 91 gigabytes per, per second, you can probably get on a desktop, like a moderately sized desktop uh, computer. So if this is the performance that we're going to get, Maybe it wouldn't be a very, you know, you, maybe you can pull this off, the similar performance off as just a couple of processor threads. Couple of processor threads, maybe, I don't think one is going to be enough. So anyways, so this is method one. So you want, we're going to iteratively uh, optimize this kernel, the kernel you see on the left here, which works like this, to try to reach as high a performance that we can. So the immediate thing, that stands out, immediate potential uh, performance improvement that stands out to us is that at the very first step, when the stride is one, because a thread has been allocated to each input element, thread zero is doing something, thread two is doing something, thread four is doing something, but uh, the odd number of threads, thread one, thread three, thread five, thread seven, and so on and so on, these guys aren't doing anything ever. So that's kind of bad. Uh, the odd number of threads are never doing any work because we're assigning the, uh, if there's n elements, we're assigning n threads to everything. So uh, uh, yeah, that, that's how it happens. If this uh, was a non-SIMD architecture, if each of these, each of these threads were independent, then some of these threads not, not having any work wouldn't matter as much perhaps, I mean, depending on the architecture, because all of, these, all of those threads will just be sleeping, just like how thread uh, uh, two is going to sleep after an iteration, thread six is going to sleep after an iteration, et cetera, and so on and so on. But because we are looking at a SIMD architecture, uh, uh, thread zero to thread 31 is always going to be scheduled together. And it best performance can only be gotten when the 32 threads, uh, the 32 consecutive threads always have work to do in the same, at the same location. So this is one immediate, one problem that immediately stands out that we can try to solve. So we can maybe improve this a little bit by uh, changing the code just a little bit so that we can have better thread allocation. Instead of thread zero, a thread one not doing anything uh, and so on, 
we can assign uh, the uh, each threads to uh, 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 in, in strides of two, starting from the very beginning. So, uh, so that thread zero is doing something, thread one is doing something, thread two is doing something, everyone is doing something, at least in the very first stride. So that's good. There's at least less uh, uh, warp divergence. I mean, there's still going to be warp divergence when we get to the end of the reduction operations, but there will be less. Uh, because uh, you know there won't there won't be as many holes that are going on. Uh, in the next iterations, instead of thread uh, one not doing anything and thread two doing something and then thread three not doing anything, the thread allocation two values have been you know they're kind of grouped grouped together to the bottom of the array, so that thread zero two something, thread zero two something, and then just thread zero. The consecutive threads always have some work to do, so there's, that, so there's much less control divergence going on, much less intra-warp execution divergence going on. And the code that actually achieves this, uh, I don't think uh, it would be a good idea to actually go into the code in detail right now, but you can, if you're interested, you can take a look at it once I upload it later today. So more threads are doing work. Not only that, uh, there's less control divergence going on, which results in 33 milliseconds of uh, latency, 128 gigabytes per second. Much, much better. We've, we've gotten above 100 gigabytes per second, but uh, still not, I mean, it's still a far cry from 600 gigabytes per second. So what's the next problem that we can, uh, that we can recognize? In, one thing that immediately, well, I mean, one thing that can immediately stand out is that at every iteration, uh, the because stride increases in the in powers of twos, and the shared memory uh, bank architecture is you know the number of banks is typically a power of two. For example, I think there's thir thirty two banks in a modern CUDA architecture, uh, and because the strides also increase in orders of twos. Uh, there's pretty much always bank conflicts that happen, even as we, so for simplicity, if you assume there are four banks, when we, when we are uh, 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 reducing 16 elements, if you assume that there's four banks, four banks, the same bank within the bank architecture, within the four banks, is always being accessed until of course uh, the total number of uh, things to reduce becomes smaller, the, the banks that are accessed, there's always bank conflicts going on. Bank zero is always being accessed by this one. Bank zero is always being accessed by this one. Bank zero is always being accessed by this one. Bank zero is always being accessed by this one. So, so this will result in, even though we are using, using shared memory to, re, to kind of reduce the pressure on the global memory, because there's global uh, uh, shared memory bank conflicts happening everywhere, pretty much all the time, uh, that also reduces has uh, you know detrimental effects on on memory system performance. So next we can try to solve that. So instead of having the threads map to, uh, so if you look back on the previous uh, thread mapping, instead of having the threads being mapped every stride number of elements. So if stride is one, threads are being mapped you know, with one gaps of one. If stride is two, uh, threads are being mapped with the uh, gaps of four. And then if uh, stride is four, gaps of eight, so on and so on. Instead of uh, having threads, instead of having the, the, the array element that each thread is updating, instead of having that assigned in Stride, uh, uh, stride gaps. We can try to group all threads to the beginning of the array, so that uh, uh, instead of having the uh, uh, each thread reduce uh, it, its own number with its value plus stride, we can try to group all the threads to the bottom of the array. 
and then you know group all also the results to the bottom of the array. At the beginning, all the threads will be at if we have sixteen threads, all the uh, sixteen elements, all the threads can be grouped to the bottom eight slots, assuming you have eight threads, which will result in this iteration updating the values of uh, the bottom eight elements. And at the next iteration, uh, bottom four elements, bottom two elements, bottom one elements, elements, so on and so on. So by having all these threads access consecutive values in shared memory, so it's reading thread zero and thread one are reading from offset zero and one and writing to offset zero and one. And again, it'll be reading from offset eight and then nine, thread zero and one, and so on and so on. By uh, assigning the uh, shared memory addresses to access by each thread in a consecutive manner, we avoid uh, bank conflicts because thread zero will be accessing bank zero and then writing to bank zero. Thread one will be accessing bank one, writing to bank one. Thread two will be accessing bank two, writing to bank two, and so on and so on. As opposed to the previous example, where thread zero, let's, let's look at iterate, uh, iteration one, two. Thread zero will be reading from bank zero and writing to bank zero. Thread one is reading from bank zero, writing to bank zero. Thread two is reading from bank zero, writing to bank zero. Thread three is reading from bank zero, writing to bank zero. Always, always having uh, shared memory bank conflicts. Compared to that, this method has pretty much gotten rid of the shared memory bank conflicts. And the performance of this results in a bit less than 30 milliseconds, uh, memory bandwidth of 144 gigabytes per second, slightly better, uh, but still a long way to go. So we've so far we've fixed the uh, branch divergence issues, we fixed the uh, shared memory conflict issues, and one of the things that uh, that maybe will immediately stand out, maybe in retrospect, some, something that we should have. Uh, uh, considered when, even when we were first building this thing is that if we spawn n threads for n elements, the upper n divided by two threads, up, upper half of the threads are never used in this approach. In retrospect, this is something that absolutely should, we should have uh, thought of from the get-go, but you'd be surprised how many times a mistake like this actually happens. So I guess that's why the NVIDIA document covered this approach. So the top n, uh, n divided two threads are never actually used. So that's something we can try to solve. Instead of having more work, uh, so we're going to have more work for threads. So instead of having 1,024 elements being reduced by 1,024 threads, maybe we can, just to avoid the uh, half of the threads never doing any work, we can assign 2048 elements to each 1024 threads. And this, the approach is simple enough. Instead of having, uh, uh, when we're loading to shared memory from global memory, instead of just having each uh, thread load a single value, each thread is going to load a single value, which is the sum of one location in global memory and uh, another location in global memory, which is dried apart. So in the end, each thread, once we can actually get into this for loop, which is what was depicted by you know, the iterative computations, uh, computation tree that we showed in the previous couple of slides, once we get into this uh, for loop, half the number of threads are not going to do anything uh, from the get-go. But before we get there, at least even the upper uh, half number of threads will at least be calculating this one addition operation before we go into this for loop and not, never do any work again. So just by doing this, just by having half the threads, you know, previously half the threads were only uh, being used to load data into shared memory and nothing else, but now we have assigned at least one operation to each thread, all the threads. And that approach stacked on top of method two gives us 15.36 uh, milliseconds of uh, latency, 
200, uh, 280 gigabytes per second, about twice the performance. So we can see that at this point, computation is pretty much, bottle, at least at, still at this point, computation is bottlenecked by computation, which is surprising because if you consider the number of threads that we have on the machine and you know the peak internal throughput that these things, that, that these guys can deliver, it's kind of surprising that uh, we're still kind of computation bottlenecked. So this is a obvious solution that we, in retrospect, we should have had from the beginning. But the first question would be, what if we use the same method, you know, assigning all the work to all the threads that to at least have all the threads do at least one reduction operation being not doing anything again. But if you apply the same method to all the previous att attempts, the very first method, the interleave method, performance increase uh, reduces to about half again. With the better thread allocation, performance is improved to about half again. So we're really, really uh, still bottlenecked by comput computation at this point. We're not even, I mean, obviously, because we're not reaching 600 gigabytes per second, but surprisingly, considering the number of threads that are actually doing work, that we're still bottlenecked by computation. Another question would be, can we take this further? Can we give, so we just, we got a good performance by assigning two pieces of work to each thread, one, at least one piece of work to each thread instead of you know, half the threads not doing anything except loading data into shared memory, that's, that's still a very important work. Can we take this further, more work per thread? Of course, reduction will ev eventually happen. We, the tree-based reduction will eventually have to happen. So uh, at some point, half the number of threads will not be doing anything and then quarter the, uh, only the quarter number of threads will be doing something so on and so on. But can we uh, do this, uh, uh, do more work before you actually enter that tree-based reduction operation. Will that actually help? Because at, at this point, all threads are doing something, even though it's a little bit of work. If we increase the number of work that amount of work that each thread does, would that actually improve the performance by any you know, useful amount? So if we remember the uh, very first method, the method zero that we've talked about, which is assigning consecutive amounts of work, uh, consecutive blocks of work to each thread. Uh, that's exactly what we tried to do, have more work per, per thread. Uh, the peak performance that we had got at that point was assigning 64 elements per thread. So that's, that's an approach, that's a valid approach that we can take. So yes, method four, back to work blocks per thread. But this time, because we want to take the best of both worlds based on the stuff that we uh, did before, instead of uh, if we have, instead of uh, uh, if we spawn 10,000 threads across 10 blocks, instead of having, uh, reducing the, the value, the number of values to 10,000 per kernel invocation, uh, we're also going to use method two to reduce within each block to take the best of both worlds. Each thread will be processing, say, 64 elements per, uh, per kernel invocation. And uh, once we have 1,024 threads, each process 64 elements, which results in 64K elements being reduced to 1,024 within a block. We, we will use, the, use method two to reduce the 1,024 values to one. So we will have a small result set per kernel iteration. So best of both worlds, lots of work per thread, small result set per iteration so that we don't have to do the kernel invocation very often, uh, too many times. So this is what happens. So we uh, assign uh, the block of work starting from, let's see, work count, which is a uh, total number of n divided by the total number of threads, work count plus, uh, multiplied by the thread index. The total amount of work that this has to do is starting from work count multiplied by index to work count, uh, work count number of elements that it has to reduce. So we add everything together. And once we have all the, uh, add everything together in shared memory. And once we have all the threads done with this own piece of work, then it will, we will use the tree-based reduction uh, within a loop to actually reduce everything in the block, so 1,024 elements down to one. 
so that we can store it inside global memory and then to prepare it for the next iteration, the next iteration of kernel invocation. The issue here is that the performance is still as before, it is still sensitive to the number of blocks that respond. So the total number of threads that respond because that, uh, and we'll get into why in a bit. But the bottom line is that if I spawn 8,000, so 8K blocks, 40 milliseconds, 32K blocks, 28 milliseconds, 131K blocks, 8.52 milliseconds. That's very, very near the peak that we want to get because at this point we're reaching the bandwidth of 504 gigabytes per second. Almost, I mean, the peak we can get is 616 gigabytes per second. That's the theoretical performance. And considering some kernel invocation overheads and things like that, this is actually pretty good numbers. But if you keep, keep increasing the numbers, performance starts getting bad again. So why is this happening? And is there a way to avoid this fickleness in terms of performance is, is the next question. The, uh, I haven't been able to get very deep uh, analysis into why, but most likely the performance uh, issue comes from random access performance of DRAM, which at face value sounds very strange because DRAM, the R in DRAM is random access. I mean, RA is dynamic random access memory, but we're going to talk about this in one of the later lectures as near the end of the, uh, end of the course, but DRAM isn't really random access. We'll get into details later, but the bottom line is that if we have multiple consecutive accesses into DRAM, there's often an order of magnitude faster performance if, the, if two consecutive memory accesses is within the so-called same page and page size is multiple kilobytes. So there is a working set issue. There is spatial locality issue uh, in, in regular old, even graphics DDR memory as well. So if, you, if your uh, data access is completely random, and you're reading four bytes from totally random locations, that if, uh, if you do that, you can have an order of magnitude performance degradation or more compared to if your access is completely sequential. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely sequential because you know, consecutive accesses are faster if they're within the same block. So if, the working, if you have small units of working sets that fit inside say eight kilobytes, you will get peak performance if you read eight, if, if you have random accesses in units of eight kilobytes, even if it's completely random, you will get best performance. But as access granularity becomes smaller and smaller, if you try to do brand, completely random byte addressable, uh, in, uh, random accesses in byte granularities, then often your performance, you, you will see order of magnitude or more performance degradation. We'll get into details about this in, one, in a later part of the lectures. But most likely the fickleness and performance comes from the random access issues in DRAM. So uh, with that in mind, if we try to analyze the performance of this fickleness, the, we got the best performance when we were spawning 131K blocks. Uh, dividing the total number of elements by this number uh, per block, the working set is all the, you know, all the elements that all the threads are accessing have work in a window of 32 kilobytes. And another interesting caveat of how, you know, CUDA and, and G, uh, NVIDIA GPUs allocate work is that each block is scheduled sequentially with no interleaving between blocks on the same streaming multiprocessor. So if we have three, uh, 1,031K blocks, each of these blocks will be assigned to a streaming multiprocessor. Remember, there's, there could be a hundred or more of these things per chip. But once a block gets assigned to a uh, computation unit, it's going to, one block is, is going to be occupying that uh, resource until that block completely finishes and retires. So each block, having a work, working set of 32 kilobytes. Thankfully, if, if uh, multiple blocks are allowed to interleave, then the working set will become much, much larger, uh, causing you know, worse random access issues. 
But thankfully, it could be you know not very thankfully depending on your application features for at least for this one. Uh, thankfully, because there's no interleaving that is allowed, each block has a working set of 32 kilobytes, which apparently fits inside the uh, page bank architecture of this particular GDDR6 memory system. So when we have less number of blocks, the, uh, there will be more work assigned per block, which gives us a larger working set per block. And once the working set exceeds the, uh, the page granularities, we'll get into the details of this in a later lecture. But once it, once it exceeds, say, 32 kilobytes in size, then we start suffering random access penalty. That's why we saw bad performance when block size is small. And at the same time, if we have more blocks, then we only have smaller work per thread which in turn also results in performance penalty. It, it, the problem is reduced back to issues that we had with things like method two, for example. Uh, eventually, many threads will not be doing much work, which re results in not you know, efficient computation resource utilization. This is where we see numbers like this. But the degradation is slower in this direction than this direction, so maybe it would be a good idea to over provision blocks. But still, this is a pretty fickle uh, thing. Considering the method, everything from methods uh, one to three had pretty consistent, I mean, it was a deterministic almost kind of performance, but method four is bad in terms of the fickleness, sensitivity of performance to these you know, user tunable parameters. And unless we have a, a, a algorithmic deterministic way to come up with these parameters, then this is you know, not too dependable. That's not good. So maybe you can try to re re remove the random access issue from, uh, from this approach. The problem here is that we were using, we were assigning consecutive blocks of uh, data to each thread. So if let's say four threads are being spawned, this much memory is the working set. And depending on the number of blocks, depending on the number of elements, this working set can become very big, very fast. So maybe it'll be a good idea to interleave the memory accesses of each thread. So uh, this red block, one red block, instead of being assigned to one thread, maybe 32 threads can work on this block and then 32 threads can, the same 32 threads can lockstep work on this one and then this one and then this one and then this one. If we, if we approach it in this way, uh, each warp, because you know, uh, all the threads in a warp work in lockstep, each warp will be uh, all together looking at this block, all together looking at this block, all together looking at this block, so on and so on. Once, we, once each warp moves all together to this block, we don't have to look at this one again. Fixing the uh, working set into kind of a moving window fashion to be much, much smaller because we only need to be looking at this one red block per block step. Instead of say, if we have four threads, instead of having to look at all, all four of these blocks in an interleaved way uh, at the same time. And this, this latter approach, so this, uh, uh, prior approach will have much, much smaller working set size. So maybe you can do this. We can set the stride instead of before having the, in the, in the approach before, because we were assigning consecutive work to each thread, stride of you know, in, index increase per, uh, in, within a thread would be one. But we can do something similar to what we were doing with the uh, well, it's not a tree-based thing. So we, we can try to increase the, we can try to move the window of access in, in a uh, lockstep manner. To set the stride of total, uh, set the stride of data accesses to the total number of threads in a grid, a grid being the unit of kernel invocation. So if it's 10 blocks, each with 1,000 1, thread, the stride would be 10,000. So in this way, Maybe I should have had a, had a diagram here. In this way, 
the consecutive consecutive threads, just like how I uh, tried to show in the previous slide, will will access consecutive addresses because the window will be moving forward altogether. At least, maybe across warps, they can be on different locations in the program. But at least threads in a warp always access contiguous uh, multiple contiguous addresses at once. So instead of having work increase, uh, so I being the, uh, uh, the global memory offset that I'm reading at this particular loop iteration and increasing I by one, I can increase I by grid size, grid size being the size of the block, uh, size of the block multiplied by the number of blocks in a grid. So we can move all the, let's say if the total number of threads is 10,000, Thread zero will be reading offset zero and then 10,000 and then two, uh, 20,000, 30,000, so on and so on. Thread one will be reading uh, offset one, 10,001, 20,001, 30,001, so on and so on. And because all of these threads in a single warp are, uh, are issued together and they operate in lockstep because of SIMD, uh, at loop iteration zero, uh, Thread one will be accessing zero, uh, thread zero will be accessing memory address zero, one will be accessing one, two will be accessing two, three will be accessing three. And at the next loop iteration, thread one will be accessing one, uh, uh, 10,001, thread zero will be accessing 10,000, thread two will be accessing 10,002, thread three will be accessing 10,003, so on and so on. At every, any given time, 32 threads will be accessing 32 consecutive address locations kind of removing the random, random access issue. And this gives you reliably high performance. Sweeping from block size, remember the block size in the previous example was quite large and you know, the, the performance was quite, quite fickle. But here, uh, because you know, we got rid of the random access problem pretty much, the performance is pretty stable regardless of how many blocks. I mean, we, this, this is, you know, unreasonably large number of blocks, not really, but it's relatively large number of blocks spanning from only 256 blocks all the way to 256K blocks. The performance is still within kind of the, you know, envelope. And at 808K uh, blocks, we are getting the best performance we've seen so far at 7.8 milliseconds or 550 gigabytes per second. And this is uh, how the farthest I got. And I think this is very close to uh, the peak performance we can get from this particular system because we are, there's also issues of, um, kern, we're iteratively invoking the kernel multiple times. So there's the issue of uh, uh, kernel invocation overhead. There's some, there's probably some, not a lot, but a little bit of uh, uh, block swapping overhead and things like that. So I'm, I'm I'm fairly confident this is very close to the peak that we can get. And uh, I'm going to remind you that starting from the method zero, which is, I guess, the naive way, it could have been the naive way to assign work to uh, a 10,000 or more number of threads in a highly parallel machine like a GPU, we have which achieved almost an order of magnitude performance improvements just by reorganizing the computation. And the reorganization happened in many dimensions, many facets, including uh, intra warp control diversions and taking care of that, taking care of uh, shared memory bank uh, conflicts, and then uh, random access issues in backing DRAM and things like this. And all of this kind of depend on the knowledge of the uh, underlying computer architecture. If you didn't know that the GPU had a uh, banked shared memory architecture that you, you hi highly unlikely that you will be able to reason about this, why, why that could be a performance reason for performance degradation. If you didn't know about the random access issues in back in DRAM, it's highly unlikely that you will be able to reason about the performance uh, <clears throat> fickleness that method four was having. If you didn't know about the intra warp uh, control diversions, then uh, it, it, could be, it would be difficult to reason about why method zero had the performance problems that it had. And, my, and, and I'll remind you that uh, up, even up until we got to this point, many of the kernels were actually computation bound, not because the peak performance of the chip was lacking, 
but because of issues like uh, intra warp control diversions, just a lot of the threads weren't doing anything, even though they're there already. Even though threads were being spawned on these cores, uh, the algorithm wasn't giving them any work to do. <clears throat> so yes, this is how far I got. I will also upload all these code uh, as well as the slides. So if you if you want to experiment with them, uh, have fun. And if you discover anything cool, please let me know. And uh, the NVIDIA guide does suggest a couple of more approaches to uh, get higher performance, including things like unrolling the loop, oops, including things like unrolling the uh, loop, the, the loop that is internal to each kernel invocation, the tree base reduction per thread, a loop unrolling when active threads become less than 32. Uh, because if you remember, I don't think I pointed this out, so maybe you don't. Uh, at each of these loop iterations, we needed to have a sync threads call. All the threads needed to be synced because um, uh, some threads were reading from shared memory locations that other threads were writing to. And the thing that this optimization tries to fix is that within a warp, if we no have the knowledge of the size of the warp, Within a warp, we know that there can be no, uh, each thread will always be executing the exact same location. So th there's no need for synchronization within a warp. So maybe we can, uh, the NVIDIA guide suggests writing a uh, uh, function which uh, spells out the entire five, last five iterations of the loop in a non, uh, uh, non-looping, non-sync threads way, depending on the you know natural inherent synchronized, synchronized uh, characteristics of threads in a loop. So, loop unrolling is the right way to go here. Instead of adding, say, an if statement to the sync threads to check if uh, uh, the total number of threads have decreased under thirty-two, because adding the if statement also adds overhead. So adding the uh, loop and rolling is the right way to go about things. But interestingly, on modern chips, for example, on the RTX 2080 Ti that I was running all of these things on, the, this change measured pretty negligible performance differences. Sometimes it was even slower. So in the purpose of the, these deck of slides, I omitted them. So the best performance I got is still the approach, uh, the last approach that I showed. Another interesting caveat is that 616 gigabytes per second, which is the backing memory bandwidth, uh, is roughly 150 giga operations per second. So 150 integer ads per second. And remember the peak performance, if, of course the peak uh, catalog performance in the, is in the order of flops, the floating point operations. So the, it may be different a little bit, but um, most likely still within at least that ballpark estimate. Remember the peak computation capabilities of this chip is 13 teraflops, 13,000 gigaflops, which is a far cry away from 150 giga ops. We are still very, very much bandwidth bound if we are just uh, looking at the uh, comparison between the peak internal computation capabilities and the DRAM. Uh, and the DRAM performance. It is still a very bandwidth bound problem. But getting to here involved a lot of uh, you know, architectural, uh, architecture aware computation organization, which is the interesting part of this application. So, so far we've looked at two applications, matrix multiplication and parallel reduction. And in the end, both of these things turned out to be kind of bandwidth bound. There's a lot of asterisks there, uh, but it, it is both of these approaches have turned out to be kind of bandwidth bound. So the question becomes, can we, are there problems in which we can actually, you know, reach peak internal flops? If we can actually, are there, you know, interesting classes of problems in which the flop count is actually the, the defining factor in performance? And there's a couple of those as well but 
um, let's just go over one of them. Application three, option pricing. Some of you may be interested in this as an application or I don't know, potential career path. This is a, a application in computational finance. An option is not just in computational finance and finance in general. And finance is a, I won't go into too much details first because I don't understand this too well, but and second, you know, this isn't a computational finance class, this is a computer architecture class. So just to give the high level introduction. In finance, options is a contract which gives the buyer uh, of this option asset the right, but often not the obligation, the right to buy or sell an underlying asset at a specified price or a specified date. So when you buy an option, it gives you the right to buy an underlying asset at a fixed price that you agreed upon when you bought the option, regardless of how the market changes in the future, uh, regardless of whatever happens, you have the right to either buy or sell this asset at a previously agreed upon uh, 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 cost. So the question is, if there's an option up for sale and people are bidding for it, for example, or, or there's a, someone put up a cost for this option, the question is, how much should I pay for this particular option of this particular uh, uh, characteristics? And of course, this depends on the drift of the market. It depends on what happens in the market. What, you know, a lot of randomness factors and things like that. So some people argue that this isn't actually predictable. But there are methods that kind of work. Of course, they don't always work. If, if they did, a lot of things would have been changed. And we won't go into too much details about this again, because this isn't a uh, computational finance class. But there's an algorithm called Black-Scholes. Uh, there's an equation called Black-Scholes. Interestingly, Black-Scholes is a, uh, one of the benchmarks on the spec CPU marks. If you ever ran spec marks, like a full suite on your architecture or simulator, you probably did run Black-Scholes as well. It is a, uh, no need to actually go into the details of this. I just want to say that this is a partial differential equation, which has, which involves things like the underlying cost of the asset, and there's a random variable which might you know, change across time, and there's market drifts, standard deviations, and lots of randomness going on. And the way a lot of this, uh, many times this is actually used is assuming that there's a, a randomized Brownian motion in cost going on, which is not always true, but this, that's not a kind of worm that we want to open today is that depending on a set of random variables, uh, we can kind of simulate the, an instance of how this price will change as time moves forward, depending on a set of random variables. So here we can use something like the Monte Carlo method. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Monte Carlo method is a way of trying to predict uh, trying to get a statistical overview of a system, let's say, by simulating a massive amount of instances and averaging the return or looking at the distribution of these things, statistical distribution of these things. Because there's a random variable, among a few other things, uh, there's a random variable that uh, decides the uh, actual cost of this asset as time goes on. If we create a large, massively large set of random variables, which are which hopefully are kind of representative of the actual market, and we simulate all of those and look at the distribution of how these how uh, these simulations end up, then maybe we can kind of get a sense of what is the likely cost of this asset at a particular given time. So the goal of this, because there's not a lot of data that goes into this kind of computation. You pretty much start with a starting cost and then you just keep generating random variables to see where each uh, cost value goes up or down over a fixed set of time. So there's not a lot of data that needs to be stored inside uh, off chip DRAM. Every thread, there's pretty much no communication between each thread. Each thread just works on its own thing. So if you spawn 10,000 threads, 10,000 threads will be working on with pretty much even no shared memory. 
everything will be working on a small set of local registers with no synchronization, no uh, large off-chip data accesses, no nothing. So hopefully this will be a uh, uh, embarrassingly parallel problem. And uh, I haven't actually tried, uh, been able to evaluate this uh, on my own yet, partially because the I haven't run the code on the local machine. I just have these numbers from a paper that someone wrote. And assuming this was back in 2016, so assuming they were using GTX 180, uh, which was kind of the one of the better GPUs at the time, which has 2050 CUDA cores, Compared to the, uh, yeah, there's no memory usage, no, not even shared memory, completely computation bound, no synchronization, no memory access, no nothing. So in this example, compared to the, the kind of good GPU they were using and the kind of good CPU that they were using for as comparisons, they were getting roughly 537 uh, X performance improvements compared to a single thread, which is, uh, pretty good compared to the, well, I guess compared to things like the uh, 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 matrix multiplication that is kind of expected numbers, but assuming the uh, GTX 1080 process, uh, GPU with 2,500 CUDA cores and taking into consideration the relative weakness of each CUDA core compared to a CPU core, we are, they were seeing pretty much linear scaling on, uh, with more CUDA cores. So yeah, that's good. And I guess one thing, yeah, yeah. And that's good. So we've looked at uh, three uh, applications, which hopefully are indicative of how good GPU programming should be done. Uh, we looked at the matrix multiplication example, which is which was a mix of computation boundness and uh, 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 data access memory bound problems. Eventually, they kind of settled down into being a memory bound problem, as do matrix multiplication tasks often do. Uh, second is uh, uh, was a parallel reduction problem, uh, which was supposed to be a uh, memory bound problem. It was supposed to be a very, very memory bound problem and it is, but we show that um, there was a lot of kinks we had to work out starting from the basic implementation that we, we would think of until we can actually get to the, uh, get the GPU to be working at an efficient enough way that it actually does turn into a memory bound problem. And to kind of break away from these um, things, there was also an embarrassingly parallel problem option pricing which doesn't have any kind of uh, shared memory access resulting in pretty much uh, uh, linear scalability with the number of threads. So depending on, so I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of, well, actually this, this is a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I think this was a pretty, uh, well, maybe, because I can't say for sure because I haven't actually looked at this code, but I'm sure even for this option pricing uh, approach, there were some architectural caveats they need to work around to actually get this linear scalability to remove things like intro warp, you know, control diversions and things like that. But it, once we take memory out of the picture, this, this something like this becomes attainable, I guess is the bottom line. 